This week is Parshas Ki Savo, which means when you shall come. And the Parsha begins with a mitzvah that becomes relevant once the Jewish people conquer the land of Israel and they settle it. As we know, this hasn't happened yet in the Torah, but under Joshua, the Jewish people are going to enter Israel and they're going to spend seven years in war with the local people, the Canaanite, various Canaanite nations that are there. And after seven years of quieting the land, they're going to spend seven years dividing it up. We had it earlier where Moshe tells the nation that they have to divide up the land. Every family uh, gets a, uh, a ancestral homeland, a special, a special parcel of land for their family, divided up amongst the 12 tribes uh, and done all by lottery. So after all that is done, everyone's settled down, the Jewish people, uh, there's a new mitzvah that becomes applicable called Bikurim, or first fruit. So someone has, uh, we know Israel, the land that's flowing with milk and honey, there are seven fruits that are special to Israel. And we had it a few weeks ago in the Parsha, where Moshe tells the nation, you're going to a land, a land flowing with milk and honey, but also a land that has exceptional yields of seven different fruits. Chita seora, which is wheat, and barley, and grapes or vines, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. And these are the seven fruits that are special in Israel. And there is a mitzvah brought in this week's parsha regarding uh, yields of these seven fruits. And that is that the first fruits, when it, when, when it starts to bud, when the new crop starts to uh, blossom, the owner goes and he ties a string around the little nub that's going to be a fruit. And that, once it's, it's fully grown, he puts it in a special basket and he takes it to Jerusalem and he gives it to the Kohen and he has a very long proclamation as detailed in the first 15 or so, 12 verses, 11 verses of our Parsha. Now, there's an interesting midrash at the beginning of the Torah. The very first word in the Torah is beratious, which means in the beginning or of the first, uh, quite literally. And, of course, the first verse in the Torah talks about that in the beginning, the beginning of time and space, the Almighty created heaven and earth. But the midrash uh, tries to probe what is this idea of beratious in the beginning uh, that uh, maybe seems to reveal what exactly is God's purpose in creation. And the, the Midrash offers several uh, several answers to the question of why God created the world. For example, the Midrash says that God created the world for the Jewish people because the Jewish people are called racious. There's something about us that is worthy of creating the world, and that's an idea we'll see again and again in this week's parsha. Alternatively, the Midrash tells us that the Almighty created the world because of Torah, because Torah is also called racious, the first. And finally, the Midrash says that the reason why God created the world is because of Bikurim, because of this mitzvah of the first fruits, because it too is called racious. Where is it called Rashis? In the second verse of the Seeds Parsha, chapter 26, verse 2, Velakhta me Rashis. And you shall take from the first culpri of every fruit of the land that you should bring from the land, bring it, put it in a basket, bring it to Jerusalem, to the temple, give it to the Kohen, etc. So there's an astonishing claim in the Midrash that there's something about this mitzvah, this mitzvah of Bikurim that is so critical, essential, vital, and fundamental that it really encapsulates the reason why God created the world. And that, of course, is an astonishing claim, and it's worthy of us trying to maybe understand what this myth was all about, and by extension, understand why God created the world. So, Rashi in verse 3, verse 3 begins, you come to the Kohen, whoever the Kohen may be, and you start speaking to him. And you speak to him, but really you're talking to God or talking to yourself, that I'm, I'm so happy to be in the land of Israel, the land that was promised to our forebearers. And you announce, you give a little bit of a history lesson about the history of the Jewish people, all the way back to Jacob and his father-in-law. His father-in-law wanted to destroy 
everything. He wanted to destroy Jacob and thus kill the Jewish nation in its infancy. But of course, the Almighty saved him. But ultimately, Jacob's family went to Egypt and they were there for a long time. But they flourished and became a great nation and the Egyptians tormented us. And by the way, this entire section is uh, one of the central sections of the Haggadah that we read on every Pesach and every Passover or Seder. And the Egyptians did bad to us and they tormented us and they uh, and they persecuted us and we called it to God and Hashem saved us, the Almighty saved us and he saw our pain and our suffering and our tormenting and took us out of Egypt with an outstretched arm, etc. and brought us to the land of Israel, the land of flowing of milk and honey and behold, here I am with my basket of new fruits. And you place it there before the altar, you bow down to God, and you should be happy with all the goodness that God did to you. So Rashi, in verse 3, he pulls a theme, which is uh, perhaps the, or at least one of the core themes of Bikurim. And that is, when someone has something good done to him, and it doesn't really matter how good it is, it could be something very little. There is no minimum requirement for Bikurim. Someone who has a thousand orchards and produces a tremendous yield, well, they have to bring the first fruits. And someone that has a little patch in the back of his lowly abode that only yields a little bit of fruits, he has the same mitzvah to bring the first fruits and have this recognition. Moreover, Rashi tells us that When the person fulfills this mitzvah, it's not that they're completing an act of gratitude per se. Rather, they're avoiding ingratitude. So not only when someone has a lot of goodness, is it worthy, is it appropriate of them to acknowledge that and thank the Almighty for all the goodness that God did to them. But even if someone has very little and maybe on relative terms, you would say this person kind of got the short end uh, the, or the short end of the stick in life, still, if that person does not recognize what God do, does for him or her, then there is a certain lack of recognition of God's goodness, and that would be pro- problematic. And therefore, to avoid that, we fulfill this mitzvah. Perhaps we can suggest, and maybe we'll expand on this idea in a little bit, perhaps we can theorize or speculate that when the Midrash tells us that the entire world was created for Bikurim. Well, Bikurim is one of the 613 mitzvos, but it does capture an essential theme that is present and is a focal point of all of mitzvos. And by extension, it's a reason why the world was created. And that is that man acknowledges the goodness that God does to him or her. We are placed in a world and we're given a lot, everything for free from God. And the challenge and the dilemma and the conflict, the sensual conflict that this reality engenders is that man is not necessarily predisposed to acknowledge goodness done to him by others and certainly not by a infinite but invisible God. But if a person thinks about it and ruminates a little bit upon upon it and dwells upon it, it's very likely that they will reach the conclusion that God does so much good for them and therefore God is worthy of or, or it's appropriate for them to acknowledge all that goodness. And that is the goal of Torah and that is, by extension, the goal of the world. So I want to—that's that, just idea number one. I want to put this aside and try to go a little bit deeper on this idea. There is a second midrash, and the midrash also says that the merit of bikurim of this mitzvah of the first fruit is so important that entering and settling the land of Israel, all that hinges upon proper fulfillment. Of this mitzvah. So we're told just that the power and the merit of this mitzvah, it, it's, it's the goal of the world, and it's the one mitzvah that is the determining factor of success or failure of settling the land. But you'll notice 
this is not the only agricultural mitzvah in the Torah. There's many, many mitzvahs that are related to agriculture. Almost all of them are exclusive to Israel. For example, we'll see this a little bit later on in the parasha. There's something called teruma and maiser, or maaser, which means various forms of tithing. And when someone has any grain... Uh, even though the commentaries debate exactly is it applied to all grains or not, or, or not all grains, that's a separate question. But when someone has a yield in Israel, grown in Israel, they have to give a certain amount of it to the Levite, a certain amount of it to the Kohen, various different years. They have different amounts that or different uh, recipients of those tithings. But those mitzvos are somewhat different than this seemingly similar agricultural mitzvah, Bikurim. For example, someone, let's say, has a uh, a thousand bushels of wheat that they uh, that their land yielded in a given year. So they have to give ten percent of that to the Levite. They have to give a hundred bushels to the Levite. What if they don't give a hundred bushels to the Levite? Well, then that particular grain is prohibited for consumption. They're not allowed to eat it until it has been tithed. And if they eat it, it's actually one, it's a very severe sin to eat untithed grain. But suppose someone says, you know what? I don't want to eat it. I'm just going to let it sit and rot. Well, in that instance, if someone doesn't want to eat it or sell it, they can actually avoid or evade the mitzvah and they don't need to give it to the Levite. Yes, ideally you would want to eat it and you would want to give it to the Levite, but it is possible to have a loophole and to avoid fulfillment of this mitzvah. Whereas Bikurim, Bikurim, irrespective of someone's interest in eating the rest of the, uh, the rest of the crops, they have to fulfill this mitzvah. So, of course, the obvious question is why? I know the difference between Bikurim and the rest of the agricultural mitzvahs of Israel is that all the other agricultural mitzvos go into effect immediately upon entering. Whereas this particular mitzvah is only after the land is divided. So there's a 14-year gap between when the Jewish people are obligated in all the agricultural mitzvos and uh, when they are obligated in this particular one. Of course, the obvious question is Why? Uh, and additionally, you see, this is the, the, there's there's so much ceremony in this mitzvah where someone needs to delineate the whole history of the Jewish nation, beginning with Jacob and Laban, which could be a thousand years prior, or even even more. So why? What's so? What, what's the meaning behind this mitzvah? So perhaps we could say, uh, kind of extending the theme of Rashi that. When someone brings us, they have gratitude and appreciation to God. But what happens when someone does not have gratitude and appreciation for God? When someone attributes their own successes to their might and the strength of their hand. The alternative to gratitude is not necessarily ingratitude. It's a lack of faith. Because when someone doesn't appreciate what God does to them, well, if they acknowledge what God does for them, then they will certainly appreciate it. Thus, if someone doesn't appreciate it, that essentially reveals that they don't even acknowledge it. And they, therefore, they think that it's it's all ours. The, the, the Almighty is in the heavens, and we're here, and we have no relationship. There's no interface of those two worlds. And that, of course, is the central conflict of life. The Jewish people, they get to Israel— And they've been living with God in close proximity, so to speak, for the past 40 years. And now they're in Israel. And they engage in war. And they settle the land. And regular life begins. And when regular life begins, and the supernatural way of God treating them is removed, what does someone say? This is my field. This is my crops. This is my hard labor. This is mine. This is the strength of of my hand, this is my power and strength of my hand. And therefore, specifically at this time where it is a person is susceptible 
to reject God, when someone is living in a normal world, that's when this mitzvah kicks in. And therefore, someone has to make all these announcements and talk about the history and talk about what, talk to themselves essentially and talk about how God is involved in every step of history, all the way back to Jacob. The Almighty was planning how this nation is going to be set up. And all this talk about going to Egypt and suffering and being saved, all that is to try to stir the memory of the collective memory of the Jewish nation, that God is involved with us specifically as a nation, but certainly as a, uh, even broadly and more broadly as a species, is involved with us. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us to recognize that with our behavior. And indeed, maybe we could say quite simply that this is why God created the world, that the human beings should have the challenge of Bikurim, where they're living in a world and God is invisible. And the challenge, will they recognize God's dominion and accept it? Or will they ignore and neglect it and then uh, they are going in opposition of what God wants. And I think just bringing this full circle, it is interesting that the idea of gratitude and appreciation, and indeed the Hebrew word for gratitude is hoda'a, and it's also the same word for acknowledgement of truth. For example, if someone is accused in court and they admit their guilt, they do a hoda'a, they do an acknowledgement of a truth. And those two ideas don't seem to be related. When I appreciate someone's goodness, I thank them, I give gratitude, I give hoda'a, and when I acknowledge my own guilt, I acknowledge the truth, it's also hoda'a, and perhaps on a deep level, they're really the same thing. When someone recognizes the fact that God, that God does good to us, all they are essentially doing is acknowledging the fact. Yes, it's a fact which is hard to recognize. It's a fact that maybe is obscured by design, but that's the objective of Torah and by extension, the objective, the objective of the world. Uh, the next section talks about what's called Vidu Meiser. Uh, Meiser, again, is tithing, and there's a seven-year cycle, agricultural cycle, uh, that affects uh, what kinds of tithing are done. So every year, there's what's called uh, Meiser Rishon and Meiser Shani. Meiser Rishon is the 10% of the yield is given to the Levite. Meiser Shani, the second tithing, is actually consumed by the person themselves. So when I have a, a thousand bushels, I give 10%, uh, percent, 100 of them to the Levite. 100 of them is called the second tithing, which is actually mine and for my consumption, but only when I bring it with me to Jerusalem. So in the Jewish calendar, there are three festivals that there's a specific mitzvah of going and making pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And when people would come uh, at various points in the year, they'd bring with them their Meiser Shani, their second tithing, and they consume it in Jerusalem. Now, every third year, this is called Meiser Ani. There's where you give 10% to the poor person. But regardless, every three years, you have to make an accounting of all the various tithings that you did and to make sure that you fulfilled your duty. And when you do that, you actually go to the temple again and you make another proclamation of... Uh, where you say, I removed all the holy things, which is a reference to the tithings from my house. I've given to the Levite, to the proselyte, to the orphan, to the widow. I've, I've done everything that I was instructed. I didn't, uh, I didn't transgress any of the prohibitions. I didn't consume them in, improperly. I hearkened to the voice of Hashem, my God. I've acted according to everything you have commanded me. And then you have an ad added prayer. Okay, I did my job. Give mercy in the Jewish people on the land of Israel, like he promised to our forebearers. So these are two mitzvos that kick off the parsha. Both of them have these proclamations, very important ideas. 
And I think, you know, for us, uh, it's important for, uh, for us to make sure that when we have our debts, uh, that we make sure that we get them taken care of, we fulfill them so we too can ask God and pray for God that he uh, fulfills his, his pledge that he did to our forebearers and gives us goodness, prosperity, health, etc. Now, the next little section here, beginning with verse 16, a very fascinating little section of verses, because I think it does capture what it is about the relationship between the Jewish people and their creator and their God, the Almighty. And I think this is, again, a theme of the Parsha. We're, we're reaching the end of Deuteronomy. We're reaching the end of the Torah. And we've had a just a, an incessant flow of mitzvos in the middle part of Deuteronomy. And now Moshe is kind of touching up uh, on his message to the nation. And it, it ends off, essentially, the rest of the Parsha, the rest of the Torah are talking about the relationship that we should have or ought to have with our Creator and the consequences of us going off, off course, as we'll see in this week's Parsha. But there's a remarkable string of verses here. Beginning with verse 16. I want to read it to you here. This day, Hashem your God commands you to perform these decrees and these statutes, and you shall observe and perform them with all your heart and with all your soul. This is a refrain we see again and again in Deuteronomy. Moshe is exhorting the nation, fulfill the mitzvos, observe the mitzvos, observe the decrees and the laws and the statutes with all your heart and all your soul. And then 17, 18, 19, very fascinating verses. You have chosen Hashem today to be a God for you, to walk in his ways and to observe his decrees, his commandments and his statutes and to hearten to his voice. There is a bilateral relationship here. We have distinguished God to be our God and we have committed ourselves to observe his mitzvot and his edicts and his statutes and to heed his voice and to go in his ways. And then verse 18, and in return, God selected us to be a chosen nation, to be a treasured people, and to make us supreme over all the nations that he made for praise, for renown, for splendor, that you will be a holy people to Hashem, your God, as he had spoken. All the way back in the middle of Exodus at Sinai, we're told that we're going to be a mamleches kohanim v'goy kadosh. We're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is the idea of chosen people. Chosen people, we, and you look how, how it's set up over here. Verse 17, we cho- choose God, we accept upon ourselves to walk in his ways, to observe all his mitzvahs, and to hearken to his voice. And therefore, verse 18 and verse 19, we are God's chosen people. Which is why there's this oddity that we are the Jewish nation, at least we claim, that we're God's chosen people. And that is transmitted biologically. We're descendants of Abraham. And the children of Jews are Jews, whether they choose or not. On the other hand, it's not linked to biology alone because people could join. You have converts, gayrim, proselytes, who could say, we're in. And here's the answer. The answer is yes, by default, a Jew is a Jew because of choices of the past. But choices of the past are the ones that rendered the result of a chosen nation. We chose God. We accepted upon him, upon ourselves, his Torah, and to go in his ways and to hearten his voice. Therefore, he says, okay, you'll be my chosen nation. You'll be my treasured people. And you'll be God's chosen nation. If someone voluntarily opts in, if someone says, I want to be part of this, I want to accept upon myself to do the mitzvos, to hearken to his voice, God should be our, our God, to go in his ways. Right away, they slip into verse 17 and verse 18 and 19 follow suit as well. Now, there is another important thing that we're going to see a little bit later on in the Parsha, uh, back to verse 16. So if you, if you actually look at it, it seems uh, it, it's, it's structured in a little bit of a strange way. Uh, this day, Hashem your God commands you. Uh, mitzvahs were commanded to us this day. Uh, what does it mean this day? Moshe is talking to them. It's within a month before he dies. And he's giving a, a, a speech to the nation. But there's many mitzvahs that were given to the nation prior to this day. 
So why is why is Moshe mentioning that this is the day that God commanded us to do mitzvos? So the Rabban says quite simply that all the new all the new mitzvos that the Almighty wanted Moshe to command to the nation in Deuteronomy are essentially finished. There's a few more um, isolated mitzvos later on, but the bulk of the mitzvos that the Almighty wanted Moshe to convey to the, to the nation, well, that was done. And therefore, he's not referring to all mitzvos in general. He's saying, well, this batch of mitzvos that I'm trying to tell you at the end of my lifetime, today we finished um, what I com- was commanded to teach. That's what Ramban, that's how Ramban answers the problem of the wording of the verse, on this day Hashem commands us. You look at Rashi, Rashi says something entirely different. Hayom hazeh Hashem alokeichem atzavcha. On this day Hashem commands you, Bechol yom yihiyu be'einecha chadashim. And every day, it could be September 5th, 2017, it's 3,329 years and several months after Sinai. Today, I should treat a mitzvah. We should all treat mitzvos the exact, with the same enthusiasm and passion as if today we were commanded in that mitzvah. Which, of course, is, a, is an astonishing thing. Like ha- We have to try to find a way to have the same zest and passion for mitzvos many, many years after we've been doing them, and they naturally should get stale. So Rashi is telling us that we have to find a way to make it that each day it's new. How that works, we're going to hold off for a little bit. Uh, Because Rashi repeats this in chapter 27, and we'll try to see if we can understand it a little bit later. Now, the idea of the halachta bidrachav, of walking in the ways of God. In verse 17, one of the items that distinguish our nation is that we accepted God, we accepted upon ourselves this mitzvah of walking in the ways of God. What does that mean? So this verse actually appears several other places in Torah. And the Talmud says, what, it, what does it mean to go in the ways of God? Mahu rachum, af ato heye rachum, mahu chanun, etc. What does this mean? Just as God is merciful, you be merciful. Just as God is benevolent, you be benevolent. Just as God is slow to anger, we too should follow suit and be slow to anger. All the characteristics, the midos of God, we should try to emulate that in our behavior. I want to share a, an, I think it's a mind-blowing insight uh, from my grandfather, Rabbi Shlomo Wolby of Blessed Memory, regarding this idea of walking in the ways of God. Now, he's addressing a contradiction in several sources. There's a little bit of inside baseball here, a little, little esoteric ideas, but there's several sources scattered throughout Jewish literature that seem to reach opposing conclusions. On one hand, we're told that mitzvos, God's commandments, they're gzeros, they're edicts, their rules don't have any necessarily for us any reasons. We do them because we're serfs to God, we're slaves of God, we're subject to God, we don't ask questions, a slave doesn't ask questions, you just follow orders. That's one theme found in the sources. A second theme is that, no, mitzvos are there to bring us character and to bring us towards perfection and to bring us towards mercy and to bring us towards kindness. So which one is it or can it be both? So my grandfather suggested as follows. God's character on a theological level, we say God's character is non-essential. What this means is is that we have to always separate theologically. If you look at Rambam, 
in the very first chapter of Rambam, he tries to explain a very fine idea of distinguishing between God himself and the way God behaves. God doesn't have any essential character, right? That would, uh, that's a, that's a theologically in opposition to what we believe. The midos of God, the character, so to speak, of God is not, a, is not essential, which means they're flexible. So, for example, we mentioned this a few weeks ago, where when Moshe prays after, both after the destruction, I'm sorry, after the sin of the spies and after the sin of the golden calf, both times he tells God, I want you to enlarge and augment your character, which seems to imply that God's character is not, it's not fixed. It's malleable, it's pliable. And the idea on a deep level is that the Almighty chooses, decrees, so to speak, how he should be revealed in this world, how should he be manifest in this world, and how he should treat this world. So that's God's character. Mitzvos are the same thing. Uh, Mitzvos, again, are God's decrees in this world. But at their root, they are the same thing. And the idea being is that in this world, we have the way, we have God's midos. And in this world, we have God's mitzvos. When God tells us to do the mitzvos, what he's essentially telling you, walk in my ways, or these are my characters, emulate them. Thus, when someone does 613 mitzvos, he becomes what we call a perfect person, complete. And the sources talk about the fact that a person is actually comprised of 613 parts. And each mitzvah corresponds to a separate part of a person's physiology, both physical and spiritual. And thus, when someone fulfills all 613 mitzvahs, you actually achieve the result of being similar to God, of walking in the ways of God, because those mitzvos are a mirror image of those midos, of those behaviorisms, so to speak, of God. And when God gives us mitzvos, he's actually giving us the key to becoming like our creator, to emulating God, which is, to me, I think it was, it was a mind-blowing idea that just what mitzvos are. It's not just good deeds. It's not just commandments. It's much deeper. It's the fact that man has the potential and perhaps even the mandate to be like God. Of course, by des- by default, we're not like God. Well, by default, we're almost like animals. But we can become like God. Well, how do you do that? Through through mitzvos. What is mitzvos? Mitzvos is God's decrees. Just like God's characteristics, so to speak, is God's decrees. They're non-essential. What this means, of course, this is not unnecessary for us to even mention this, but we'll say just to cover our base bases here. What, what it means that man can become like God, it doesn't mean that man can become infinite or omnipotent. What it means is that God, that man can become like God's character of kindness, of benevolence, of slow to anger, etc. And indeed, if you actually look at the Sephorno in this in this particular section, uh, he says in in verse eighteen that God chose us to be his nation. What that means is to be a representation, to be an embodiment of what God wants to achieve with the human species. Well, what's the first thing we're told about the idea, the notion of man? Let us make man, nasadam, bitsal menu kid musenu, in our form, in our image. There's something about man that has the potential of being like God and the angels. And the Jewish people, through fulfillment of mitzvos, we're going to be God's chosen nation, so to speak, God's representation in the world. But again, that that is a little bit it's it's advanced for me. Um, but I think the the broad strokes of the idea are clear. But on a simple level, 
again, a theme we'll see again and again, and we have seen throughout Deuteronomy, is that what makes the Jewish people special is the fact that we do mitzvos. And we do mitzvos, and therefore we become the, cho- the chosen nation, we become the manifestation of God of the world, and we become the people that are fulfilling what was laid out all the way at the beginning of Genesis as the goal of man to become a image, in, to be in the image of God, to be a mirror example, someone who walks in God's ways. Very powerful insight. Chapter 27, Moshe, uh, together with the elders of Israel, gathers the nation and gives them a very vivid um, instruction about what they need to do once they enter the land of Israel. Once they cross the Jordan, you have to erect massive stones that are covered in plaster, and you write on the stones, Torah. So he tells them, you cross the uh, verse 4 here. It shall be that when you cross the Jordan, you shall erect these stones of which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall coat them with plaster and build an altar. And verse 8, you shall inscribe on the stones all the words of the Torah well clarified. So there's these, there's this really, it's unusual mitzvah. It's a once, it's not, it's not a mitzvah that's a, it's a um, replicable. It's, it's a once in history mitzvah. When they cross the land, they do uh, all these symbolisms of what the land represents. You get into the land, right away you cross the Jordan, you put stones right in the Jordan, you put other stones in Mount Ebal. We'll see a little bit of Mount Ebal in a little bit. And what do you do on these stones? You write the words of the Torah very clearly. Which words of Torah? Is this the Ten Commandments? Is this all of Torah? Is this just the mitzvahs of the Torah? Rashi tells us, you write them very clearly, you write them in 70 languages. And the idea being that you get to a establishment of any sort, you'll find at the door, at the entrance, a sign that indicates what this establishment is. Is it a is it a restaurant? Is it a bar? Is it a accounting firm? Uh, is it a stadium? There's always a sign that indicates what is the function of that given establishment. You get to Israel. On the doorstep of Israel, right when you cross the Jordan, there has to be a massive sign indicating what is this land about. And Moshe tells the Jewish people, you get into the land, the first thing you do is you hang up your shingle and you put up your sign and say, this mitzvah of God, Torah, that is what this land is about. Very powerful idea. Um, Verse 8, and uh, I guess essentially the rest of the of the chapter till verse till chapter twenty eight, it indicates what has to happen at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. These are two mountains, uh, somewhat near the border, and right when they cross the border, they have to make this uh, this stand uh, on this mountain. Half the nation goes onto one side of the uh, one mountain, other half of the nation goes into the other mountain, and the Levites sit in the middle and they make proclamations. And they make announcements of who is blessed and who is cursed. Eleven people are blessed, and the opposite of those eleven are uh, are cursed. But just a, a quick note here: in verse nine, we see the same idea that we saw in chapter twenty-seven. And Moshe and the Lev- and the Kohanes, the Levites, they tell the Jewish people, "Hearken and hear, O Israel, on today." you became for a nation for God. Today you became a nation. Again, we know the Jewish people became a nation 40 years prior. What is this idea that the Jewish people became a nation today? So again, Rashi says, every day you have to be as excited in entering the land of Israel and being part of the nation as if it was the first day. You cannot have a loss of novelty over time. Just like in chapter 26, it says regarding mitzvos, 
that mitzvah, so you do a mitzvah, it should be as if today you were commanded in it. So too, about being part of the Jewish nation, you have to be as excited today as you were in previous, the first time it happened. And the obvious question is, how is this possible? How, how can you have a situation where the there is no loss of novelty? Over time, you've been doing the same thing again and again. You've been part of the nation since you were born. You have to be as excited today on September the 5th, 2017. You should have the same joy and elation of being part of the Jewish nation and, what, and all of that uh, is included in that as if today we joined the nation. Uh, finally, the Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos, that whenever someone studies Torah, they have to study it every day as if it was the first time they were commanded to do that at Sinai. So, obvious question is, how is it possible? Or at least it seems to indicate that something that can become stale, something that can lose the sense of novelty it's still possible to resist that. Or that's not a fixed rule, almost a, like, a, like a physical law, that things have to have a depreciation in novelty. It doesn't have to be there. And, there, and thus it's made sense. We can be told Jewish nation, mitzvos, Torah, have the same joy and passion and zest in their fulfillment as if it was the first day. Now, just briefly, an idea that the Talmud says. The Talmud in the Book of Brachos teaches the insight that we should strive to maintain the same joy and vibrancy studying Torah every day as if it was the first day. What's the secret formula? Daily ongoing, committed action. The Talmud reveals, if someone studies Torah day in and day out, well, you would imagine that the more they engage with it, the less exciting it becomes. The more rare it is, the more novel it is. Says the Talmud, no, it's the opposite. With Torah and with mitzvos, the more committed someone is, the less, so to speak, rare it is, the more novel it is, the more excitement that they have, the more fresh and the more beloved it is for them. The Talmud says something very striking. Uh, it continues and says, if someone says Shema every day, twice, as we are commanded to do, but one day they neglect to say the Shema, it is as if they never said Shema in their life. And this follows the same principle. When someone has ironclad commitment, it brings alive what could be a ritual, what could be something devoid of meaning. When someone misses Shema for even one day, that displays a lack of commitment that reveals that even the previous recitations were just that, recitations wholly devoid of meaning. And perhaps the idea is that the way the spiritual world operates is an exact opposite with the way the physical world operates. In the physical world, we see that the more exposure someone has to a given item or to a given experience, the less exciting it is. Whereas in the spiritual world, the more exposure, the more excitement a person has with it, which is an astonishing idea uh, maybe we should elaborate on it uh, another time. The next chapter is perhaps the scariest chapter in all of Torah. Uh, you read it in the, when they read it in the synagogue, they always read it very quietly and very quickly because it is somewhat uh, sad and depressing. But I think it's... Um, very informative, very educational. Certainly, if someone has a historical sense of what's happened to the Jewish nation over our history, it is very educational to understand cause and effect of history. We, The Jewish perception of history 
is different than uh, typical or what, what you know what uh, other people's perspective of history is. And I would say, in concert with that, the Jewish perspective of God is different than the than the idea maybe most prevalent. We believe that God is involved in shaping history. And thus, and of course, we have a say in it with our behavior, but we can look back and we can even progress the gate to the future uh, regarding our behavior and what sort of response it will elicit from God. And here we're told, and this is, again, we've seen this before, but here's a whole chapter dedicated to that. If someone hearkens to the word of God, observes the mitzvahs, the commandments, then they will be on top of the world. All the blessings in the world will be uh, will overtake them. If you listen, you'll be blessed in the city. Uh, you'll be successful in the urban life. You'll be successful in the rural life. Your children will flourish. Your crops will be robust. Your livestock will be blessed. Everything will be good. You'll be blessed when you enter, when you exit. All your enemies will be destroyed. You'll have a blessing in your baskets. Everything that you touch will turn to gold. You'll be a holy nation because you observe the Torah and because you go and walk in the ways of God. The, the entire world will look at you as a model of morality and as a, uh, uh, as a, a torchbearer of God in the world. Everything will be great. And it's, 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 it's effusive. It's, it's overwhelming. Hashem will give you bountiful goodness and the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your animals and the fruit of your ground on the ground that Hashem swore to your fathers to give you. Hashem will open for you his storehouse of goodness. We always say that the Almighty is a billionaire, maybe even a trillionaire. And the Almighty says, okay, I will open up my storehouse for you, the heavens, to provide rain, to bless your handiwork. You'll land many nations, but you'll, you won't borrow. You'll have such excess. You'll be a head and not a tail. Ron Bon points out that once we're told that you're a head, of course you're not a tail. Uh, and he answers is that the Jewish people will reach the absolute apex. Not only will we be a head, uh, we'll, 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 not only will we have advancement, but we're not going to be a tail. There won't be anyone that's any higher higher than us. All this provided, verse 13, Hashem shall place you as a head and not a tail. You should be above, you should not be below. If you hearken to the commandments of Hashem, your God, that I command you today to observe and to perform, and you do not turn away from them from any of the words that I command you this day. Not right, not left. You don't do idolatry and you don't worship others, which is, again, another code to the idea that we mentioned many times that all sins really have within them uh, an element of idolatry and all mitzvahs are an embracing of faith. And then verse 15 begins with what happens should we choose to not hearken to the word of God, to not observe the mitzvahs, the decrees that he commands us, then all the curses that um, are delineated in this chapter will fall upon us. And as is tradition, we're not going to read them, because uh, if you look here in the art scroll, there's three pages of horrific, brutal curses that will happen to us, and we know historically did happen to us. If you want to get a sense of where does the Torah talk about the Holocaust or matters of that li- uh, of that ilk, uh, already our sages 2,000 years ago found parallels with what happened after the first Holocaust. There were several holocausts in, in Jewish history, but the first holocaust of the destruction of the temple and the slaughter of Betar and the Hadrianic persecutions when the Romans just totally slaughtered millions of Jews in the first and second century, the Talmud already uh, had the sensibilities to look back at Deuteronomy and to look at all these curses and to find cause and effect and perhaps even meaning in the suffering because the fact that God is doing it for our behavior, uh, that, uh, number one, shows us how we get out of it. 
And number two, it also shows us that it's not indiscriminate punishment and suffering. It has suffering or that has a meaning. I would, I would suggest that if someone, um, that people should read this, um, even though it's, it's really hard to read, but I think it's still important to read because it does give, a, give us a sense of what the Jewish perspective is on, um, on Jewish suffering throughout history. You know, the world was created with the notion that we have free will. We could choose wickedness or we could remain righteous. When we are told what happens when we choose evil and, or God forbid, if someone does choose evil and this happens to them, this is a way of realignment, of reorientation. We're, uh, we are going to be an eternal nation. That's fixed. The problem is, is that what happens when the Jewish people start veering away from what makes them unique? To be, to exist forever as a nation that mandates that you have to have a certain distinct characteristic that makes you a nation. You can't get assimilated and fall into the quote unquote melting pot and lose what it is that makes you distinct because then you're no longer a nation. It sounds great to be considered an, an eternal nation, but a necessary aspect of being an eternal nation is the fact that when you veer away from the course, you are nudged initially and then maybe even shoved back upon the course. And in in a weird way, we look at this treatment that we can and we have, and it is forecast in the Torah as will be given to the Jewish people uh, as a good sign, or it has at least a silver lining. If the Jewish people, when they got too close to losing what makes them distinct, if there was no kickback, if there was no backlash, if there was no powerful cosmic force pushing the Jewish people away from their neighbors and punishing them and persecuting them, it's quite likely that over history we would have uh, devolved and we would have lost our distinct character and we would have have, uh, disappeared. So in a weird way, we look at chapter 28 of Deuteronomy as being the source for Jewish uh, continuity. The Talmud tells us that we read this section right before Rosh Hashanah, you should end the year and all its curses. We want to make sure that we get rid of all the curses. Hopefully next year, it will be a year where God will put an end to our tra- our, our, all of our tragedies. It should be a year of blessing and, and only goodness. Um, like I said, I would advise everyone to read this because you really get a picture of uh, that other side of Jewish history that unfortunately um, is... Uh, the lot of, of, of our nation when we choose to reject God. Um, and I think it's maybe even informative today. You know, a lot of people say that another Holocaust cannot happen. Well, those same people, I would argue, if it was 100 years ago or 150 years ago, they would argue that Holocaust, like the one that happened in 1648 and 1649, in, in Russia and Poland and Lithuania and uh, the Ukraine, they would argue that that cannot happen. The fact that Khmelnytsky and his Cossacks, they killed 100,000 Jews uh, in horrific, gruesome ways, I would argue the same people saying today that it couldn't happen are the ones that were saying 150 years ago that it can't happen. Well, I hope it doesn't happen and we all hope it doesn't happen. But when someone makes that statement, they are ignoring certainly chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, but also they don't have a keen perspective of history. Um, And our hopes are that uh, it never comes to this, but it does again add some heft to the relationship that we have with the Almighty, uh, that our nation has with the Almighty. We're the chosen people and we will remain the chosen people. It's our choice how we want to be distinct. Do we want to be distinct to be an, an, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? Or do we want to be distinct 
in uh, ways that are much, much less favorable.